Walking your dog, staying safe, and having a fun time while you do it is what I'd like to chat about today with y'all. Gosh, only back in the South a few months, and I guess I'm already channeling it. But here I am. It's January. It's National Walk Your Dog Month. And so for those of you who watched the tease um, a few minutes ago, um, my question isn't, did the Pet Safety Crusader lose her mind? Rather, it is, do you have a favorite song or a chant you hum while you're walking your dog? Is it um, just that doggone tune that got stuck in your head from the night before that you can't get rid of? Or is it something motivational with a peppy beat that keeps you moving? Please, you know, as you start to join in, if it is something you want to share, go ahead and write it down in the comments. Or if you're watching this as a replay, let me know then, too, because maybe there'll be something new that Haiku and I can jive to as we're walking around the hood, so to speak. My second question to all of you today is, do you walk your dog or does your dog walk you? And is it fun or is it a chore? So, you know, the goofy little chant I was doing before is something that can make it fun, but there are certainly a lot of other things that can make it fun as well. Hello, Scott. I know you walk a bunch of doggies every day. Do you chant or sing, or what is it that you do to keep yourself motivated? Let me know. But one of the things I might mention is, you know, this may not always be practical, but changing up the location can be great. It can be um, great for you uh, visually and for your, your pet's olfactory you know, senses. Really give him some new sniffs. Let him smell some other dogs and foxes and raccoons and squirrels that he's you know, not so familiar with. So changing up the location can be good. good. New, new sights and sniffs are always a great thing. Um, sometimes it's also good to change up the location because you don't want to be predictable. I'm not saying that there are evil people out there, you know, these days, but you just don't always want everybody to know your exact routine. And very often the time you walk the dog during the day um, is pretty similar. So maybe sometimes it's a good idea to walk the route backwards or take a, you know, slightly different curve or a fork in the road and just see something new and just not be so predictable as well. Um, maybe you can even take a car ride to a different location and, you know, check out the latest park or the latest new trail. Those can be all things that make it more fun for you and your pet as well. Or ask another dog walking pal to join in with his or her dog, too. So, you know, those are a few things you can do to change it up. But as far as my question about does your dog walk you, I'm talking about manners. And on the walk, that's a great time to actually practice some of those manners that you may be a little rusty on to keep them fresh. You can even teach an old dog new tricks, um, but I'm talking about younger ones as well. Remind them of their heels, sits, downs, and stays. One of my absolute favorite ones to do with Haiku, and I think he has fun doing it, is what I call push-ups, doggy push-ups. And with a treat in my hand, we'll stop somewhere along the walk. And I will make him sit, and then I'll make him go down as I bring the treat down, and then I'll make him come back up to the sit position and stand. So it's like he's going sit, down, sit, stand, sit, down, sit, stand. And then ultimately he gets the treat. Hey, Barbara, glad you could join us. So we're talking about, you know, doing things to mix it up on the walk. And Haiku and I love doggy push-ups. Um, and it's a great way to practice that down because a lot of dogs um, have a difficult time with that down. It's also a wonderful time to practice your recall because, you know, being safety minded here and worrying about disasters and having your dog get back to you quickly. I'm not saying about taking him off leash on the walk, but maybe with a longer leash, get him ahead or run backwards away from him a little bit. Still attached to the other end of the leash, but practice those comes. So, you know, anything you can do to reinforce those manners is a great thing. I really don't suggest letting the dog walk ahead of you too much unless you're practicing a skill like this. You want him to keep his focus on you. Um, one of the things I learned from a trainer early on, and I just so agree with it, I would always teach this to my high school kids when I was teaching them to walk the dogs around the shelter, is that you have to be the most interesting thing to the dog. If you're not fun, if you don't have a happy voice, if you can't use some fun body language um, to get the dog to focus on you, it's you know just not going to work that much. 
Sure, there are times we let them just do their sniffing thing and be in their own zone, but especially when you need them to pay attention in that focus. So work on that, and very often it has to be worked on with treats to get their attention, but if that works, it's a great thing. Also, be very careful about correcting um, your dog if he's like walking in front or back of you and weaving back and forth because you can both trip. And, you know, it, it's important that you are the leader of the pack. Again, there's times for loose leash walking where the dog can just sniff and, you know, be in all his glory. But there are times, especially when you're near traffic or possibly encountering other animals or people, you really want his focus on you and he needs to follow those rules. Um, when he does well, you know, reward him. Uh, dogs are very food-based. Um, they get very happy when we reward them with treats, but I know we don't always have treats or we shouldn't always make it about that. So maybe it's a happy voice and a good boy or a good girl or a good scratch under the chin or on the belly, whatever just makes them wag. While you're walking, um, walk. So, you know, make this clear to your dog that there are going to be times where we walk and then there's going to be some of what I call the loose, loose leash time where he's not, you know, on such a tight leash with you and he really gets to sniff and take it all in. But then there's also those moments for walking where he can't explore, where you're both maybe trying to get up your cardio or maybe you need to get the heck out of wherever it is you have to be. So these are some things that can kind of mix up the walk a little bit, reinforce the skills, but don't make it seem so much like it's a training session if you're doing it together and having fun. Now, I want you to always make sure you have the best tool to walk your dog. And in a couple of weeks, since um, National Walk Your Dog Month is all month long, we're going to pick up on this a little bit, and I'm going to talk about some of the tools of the trade for walking. So we'll definitely follow that up in. But those of you that have already got on live with me, when you're walking your dog, which side of you do you have your dog on? Go ahead and write it in. There is really no right or wrong answer, but I'm just curious. Um, to me, the important thing is that you're consistent so that the dog understands which side of you he's supposed to be on. Uh, I like to just always make sure that if I'm walking along a street where there's traffic, he's not on the side of the road with the traffic, but I'm blocking him from the traffic. So there are times I do mix it up. Um, left, yeah, left, Barbara, for the most part, is... Um, what most people have done. I think this goes back decades and decades when the only times dogs really got walked was um, on the hunt. And since there are more people, and I hope I'm not statistically wrong, my left-handed friends may get on my case, but I think there really are more right-handed people than left. Um, because of that, they'd have the gun in the right hand and they wouldn't hold the dog and the, the gun in the same hand. So I think that's how initially the whole left side of you got started with our hunting dogs. And, it, and it's carried over for the most part. Left if walking one, left forward and left back when I walk four of my five. Kudos to you, Scott. Um, I, I remember walking just two of my big ones at one point, and I thought, gosh, it's going to be a whole lot easier if I get one of those couplers where I just have the one leash and the coupler. And at the time, it was two male dogs, and then I found out that caused them to raise their leg on each other. <laughs> so I, I kind of um, aborted that idea, but I'm sure you've got all kinds of wonderful tips with all of the dogs you walk simultaneously. Hey, Lori, nice to have you join us, right? I, no, you're not goofy-footed at all. It's just, you know, it's, it's what's easier for us. Sometimes one person may have a stronger hand on one side or the other. They could have had an injury or something else, and the, the key is that you want to hold that leash in a hand that you're going to keep it securely attached to. And when we talk about some of the, the tools of the trade in a couple of weeks, I'm going to just show you some of the things I've learned around the way. But, you know, certainly about like not wrapping the leash around your hand um, and, and holding it in certain ways. So we will discuss that. So thanks for chiming in on which side. But some of the things to bring along, like I said, we'll discuss further are the leash and the harness. Those cleanup bags. And people, even if you have a little teeny Yorkie, he still poops. Um, please clean up after him. Uh, not only does it end up in the sewers, it often ends up on the bottom of the shoe and then on somebody's living room floor. And I know when they're tiny dogs, um, some people think it's not much. And, you know, I'm used to walking dogs where it gets heavy to carry the poop bags. But um, I, I hope you guys concur that, you know, it's just 
you know, a nice thing to do for our fellow human beings and for animals and for keeping down bacteria. And I think it just sets a good example because if, you know, there's too much dog poop, then the dogs are, people are going to, you know, other people are going to give us a bad rap as far as pet owners. So let's keep it clean and let allow the next generations of pet owners um, to be able to go in these places that we're so enjoying. Um, water and a way to drink it for your pet. Treats, high value ones, and I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment. And maybe a few um, items for protection, your whistle, your cell phone, your umbrella that I'm also going to talk about in a moment. And of course, what would she have to say? Some sort of pet first aid kit in case the dog gets a splinter or a bee sting or cuts a paw or something along the way. So those are some of the basic things, but like I said, that's going to be um, a topic for another episode here. Um, cell phones, I feel, should only be for emergencies on the dog walk. I want you to be in the moment like the dog is with you, not be texting or being on the phone, um, really paying attention where the dogs are going. Those of you that are walking more than one dog, they can go in more than one direction. You want to make sure they're not stepping into the street. They're not stepping on broken glass. They're not eating a sandwich that could have been tainted that was tossed to the side of the road or rat poison or a dead rat or anything along the way. So just, you know, be in the moment. Keep your eyes and ears open to your surroundings and anything that your pet is about to step into or onto. So cell phones in the back pocket, we can save the texting and calls for when we're done with the walk. How much walking time do you think is enough? Um, you guys there, I've got a few of you here. When you're walking your dog, about how long do you walk it? Um, I don't, it, there's no such thing as an it for a dog. That was a total slip of the tongue here. How long do you walk him or her? Um, I, I don't, again, think there's a right or wrong answer overall, but there's a right or wrong answer for the specific animal is my thinking. Um, 20 minutes is a good amount of time. Uh, you know, it's just no dog can go from zero to 60. And I know a lot of people like will adopt a, a, an energetic dog from the shelter because they think he'll also get them up off the couch and get him exercising. But if he's been sitting in a shelter for a while, he needs to take time to build up his endurance as well. But once you've been out there walking regularly, I think what you just really need to do is pay attention to the dog. If he's starting to pant or stumble or have trouble in any you know, sort of way, you need to cut the walk shorter or at least take a break. Um, you know, the size of the dog, the, the length of his or her legs, especially in comparison to yours, can be a factor. Breed, age, general health, the walking environment, if it's a nice, smooth um, place to walk or if you're going up an incline or if you're walking through beach sand that's more strenuous so you know pay attention to the dog certainly consult your vet if your dog hasn't been on a walking program but um, keep him in mind because each one is a unique individual now I do want to breach one thing here um, in safety and what I'm talking about is you're doing everything right. You've got your dog or dogs on a leash. You're sticking to the proper places. You're not peeing on somebody's rose bush. <laughs> um, but suddenly an unleashed dog comes after you guys. What do you do? Has anybody ever had this happen? Um, you know, there, there are a couple of things that can happen with this. Um, number one, when we see a loose dog, we don't know what his temperament is right away. And very often we get very nervous. We tighten up the leash and we send that energy down the, the leash to our dog, making our dog stressed as well. For all we know, that could be the friendliest dog in the world that's coming our way. But, you know, and, and I've heard that even said that somebody then yells out because the owner's, you know, in the distance behind, you know, get your dog on a leash. Um, you know, but and then the person will say, oh, well, my dog's really friendly. Don't worry about him. Well, your dog may be friendly, but my dog may be going through some reactive issues. Um, he may be scared or intimidated by a dog that's not on a leash suddenly and quickly charging his way. And your friendly dog may suddenly get bitten or growled at by my dog who, you know, was actually doing everything right along with me. So. You know, as far as leash laws and what states have them and they're only as good as being enforced goes, you know, there's only so much we can do with that. But I just wanted to put it out there that just because a dog charges you, that dog may not be a vicious dog. 
and your dog may not be vicious either, but they've both been put into a situation where bad things can happen. And unfortunately, I've heard quite a few incidents lately um, that haven't had happy outcomes. Actually, one I heard recently where all turned out okay, and Haiku and I had an incident about three or four months ago where an off-leash dog came charging at us and really was going for him, not terribly viciously, but was definitely trying to attack, and the young kid didn't even know how to get him on a leash afterwards, but I, I body blocked and grabbed the other dog and you know, all turned out okay. But I just wanted to put this out there because for some of us, this could be one of our biggest nightmares when we're out having fun with our, our pet. So if there are loose dogs in a certain area, it, one of the first things you can do is to avoid the situation altogether, which totally sucks because if that's the path you normally want to take and you see there's a loose dog way ahead and you have to change your route, it's you know not fun for you because you were going to enjoy that walk. But if it can keep you and the, the, the dog you're walking safe, that's a good um, strategy to take. And it just is, reminds you that you have to be in the moment and be you know surveying your environment and your surroundings at all times so that you can see what's coming from different directions. Um, also, paying attention means not being on the cell phone like we just discussed so that you can really survey what's happening. A lot of things people use when a dog is coming at them are all kinds of tools. And talking to dog trainers, one of the favorite is treats and especially high value treats. What we talk about with high value treats are cut up hot dog or pieces of chicken or livery treats that really have a smell. Um, and the idea literally is that as a dog is charging you to throw these treats at them, one trainer said she even threw them right in the dog's face. Now, if a dog is totally on adrenaline, he may be lying past the treats, but so many um, pets, you know, are food minded that the treats might just give you enough time to get you and your dog to a safer location. That could mean, hey, Heather, thanks for joining in. You're a dog walker and walk multiple dogs, too, I know. Um, sometimes that may be scooping a small dog in your arms, and that one does make me nervous. Um, again, you just have to be reading the environment and, you know, doing what you think is best at that moment in time. I actually have heard of somebody that, um, quick thinking, just went to a neighbor's garbage can, and I know this is going to sound terrible, but it's, it's, it turns out good, um, and, and put the small dog in the garbage can with the lid quickly to protect it from a charging dog. The problem for me with getting a small animal in your arms is now that other dog, big or little, that's charging at you may attack both of you. So I always think it's better to um, get a dog behind you or into something else. Uh, somebody also, I've been you know, polling a lot of people lately about this. I actually wrote a blog on this, so I'd love if you'd go and check it out later. It's on the, at Gray Muzzle, like the Gray Muzzles of the beautiful senior dogs, graymuzzle.org on, on their blog. And it's all about what you do if an off-leash dog, you know, charges your way. But somebody was also telling me that they just quickly took their dog and threw it into the back of somebody's pickup and got in there, too. And fortunately, the dog charging them wasn't large enough to jump into the truck. So you really have to pay attention to that. A lot of suggestions say, well, just start walking up a driveway towards a house. If you start going towards an entryway, a dog may be concerned about getting trapped or think you're going in. That one, again, is a little bit iffy for me. It just depends on the whole setup because you might get trapped now with the dog coming after you. So the treats are a good idea. A lot of people say to carry an umbrella, the kind that with a button you can just pop open. You're not going to hit the other dog with this, but the idea is the scary motion of that umbrella just popping open. Also carrying things like a stick and a golf club. And again, not to beat the heck out of the other dog, but to bang it on the ground to make a sound to, if you're a distance away, um, whip it through the air really fast so it makes those whirring sounds. You might want to um, have an air horn, but if you ha have anything like that, make sure you've got a good hold on your own dog before you blow that horn or he's going to take off. And the same thing when you're waving a stick around. Just be so careful you don't injure your own pet. Citronella spray um, can be a deterrent. They actually are different brands on the market that may work. I don't advise using pepper spray or mace um, for a lot of reasons, but one in particular, 
the wind could blow at that moment and now suddenly you've maced yourself or your own dog and um, then you know <laughs> you're fair game for the one charging your way. Uh, as I mentioned, a body block may be in order. I'm certainly not recommending any of you put yourselves in danger, but again, reading the situation, keeping um, that dog from your dog, because you know what you don't want is for the two dogs to start staring at each other and making contact. So if you've really done some good obedience training and keep telling your dog to watch me, watch me, that can be a little bit helpful. The other thing um, I think is a great training cue to teach is to teach your dog to get behind you and sit. And what I really thought was excellent, and I have to put this out there to Iris Bloom, um, in Los Angeles who gave me this idea, but she teaches this training um, training cue for the dog to come and sit behind and actually get its head between her legs, like between her knees, looking forward. Not only is that you know, a way that the dog is behind you and not making eye contact with the other approaching dog, but there were so many people out there, and God knows, pet sitters, pet parents, we all know these people. I love you too, honey. You're out on the road and you're tuning in. <laughs> um, we all know these people that think every dog in the world loves them, that there's no dog that doesn't like them, and they just want to hug and love and kiss on every dog, and every dog doesn't want to be hugged and loved and kissed on by a stranger. And the idea of getting the dog behind you between your knees, so to speak, I think is a great deterrent for these people because I think it's less likely they're going to reach into your crotch area to pet a dog. Um, so it kind of keeps them at bay too, but that's just a great um, training cue. Uh, the unconventional ways I had written down here, I guess I've already given them, you know, the random ones like, you know, getting the dog into a, a garbage can or jumping in the back of just a random pickup truck. But the idea would be to get something between you and the dog. It's one of those things we always teach in first aid about breaking up a dog fight. The idea is to get a wall between the two dogs. Um, you know, there are some other things that go into that as well, but you just want to make sure they can't make contact with each other. Obviously, you know, if the owner is in sight, call out to them to get their dog on the leash. And, you know, I hope you're not going to have to change up your walk, that this isn't going to be an ongoing circumstance. But please do read that blog I wrote, um, graymuzzle.org, and see if that helps you. Um, I don't see anybody here saying that they've encountered this recently. So I'm glad to hear that because, unfortunately, I've heard of quite a few circumstances lately. Um, where, you know, uh, just an off-leash dog, friendly or not, has come charging at, you know, a dog on leash. Also, um, I just want to remind you to be like your dog. Be in the moment. Take time to smell the flowers. Um, enjoy the scenery. It's changing so much for me here in our new location. Every day it's something different, and I'm really trying to take that time to clear my head, but just to also watch the joy in my dog as he goes for a walk, smelling things I will never smell, some of which I never want to smell. Um, but it just can be a great bonding time for you and your pet. So if anybody has any questions for me after we're over here today, um, please leave them. I will look back and get to it. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you Monday at 11 Eastern, where we pick up again with another Facebook Live event. And I thank you guys for tuning in. Have an awesome, awesome weekend.